All right, peace and blessings, family. Uh, very good to see y'all here, to have y'all here. Uh, uh, Brother Sam P.K. Collins checking in. My name's also Raj Ploquia Glebwell. For those of y'all who are unfamiliar uh, with uh, my work and with the reasonings that we've been doing here online, uh, happy RBG Day to everybody. Uh, for those of y'all who are unaware, once again, about RBG, that's the red, black, and green right behind me. That's our flag is African people. That's been the banner of our nationhood for a hundred years today. Uh, during the convention at the Madison, at the Madison Square Garden uh, in 1920 of the, uh, with the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, ACL, this flag, uh, the RBG flag was mentioned and it was institutionalized through what was called the Declaration of the Negro Peoples of the World. And right here, as a matter of fact, it's called the Declaration of the Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World. And I have this right here, you know, in one of the many books that I read from time to time about uh, Garveyism and other aspects of African nationality, um, African nationalism, Pan-African nationalism. Uh, you see that in this declaration, uh, 20 points are out, not even 20, 40 points are outlined, 40 points uh, uh, that speak about the conditions of African people during the 1920s. And as you're reading it, one will see that the very conditions that they're talking about and the declaration of the rights that we are speaking about for black African people are very much the same, uh, uh, um, very much the same, very much alike what we are looking for right now as African people. And what you have right here, I'm gonna talk about point number seven, for example. We are discriminated against and denied an equal chance to earn wages for the supports of our families and in many instances are refused admission into labor unions and nearly everywhere are paid smaller wages than white men. So this is definitely the case today. Uh, another complaint that they lay, right? So you have about, you have 12 complaints that uh, are laid against the white supremacist system at this time. And then that's when we transition into the universal rights, uh, the declaration of the rights of the Negro people of the world. So like I said, one of those complaints was about black people arts and being left out of trade unions, which were actually institutionalized after slavery to make sure that newly freed Africans were not allowed to enter industries that were just popping up because of the industrial revolution. So we're talking about the 1920s, a period of, uh, uh, of serious economic inequality, but also a period uh, where Black African minds were revolutionizing the movement and bringing forth new ideas. So Marcus Garvey and the UNIA were inculcated in all of that. And that is what is reflected in the Declaration of the Rights of the Negro Peoples of the World. And this is all very much connected to the RBG flag because once you get to the Declaration of Rights and you get to number 39, you see that uh, it, it, it in fact mentions the RBG flag by saying that the colors, red, black, and green, be the colors of the Negro race, right? And after that, you have the Universal Ethiopian Anthem. Uh, it's a poem that is often sung at UNIA meetings. And in one of those lines, they talk about when led by the red, black, and green, all right, advance, advance to victory, let Africa be free. Advance to meet the foe with the might of the red, black, and green, right? So even as we're talking about our issues as African people and we're declaring our rights, we are also establishing nationhood with the institutionalization of a flag, a banner that represents not only African people in the United States, but represents African people all across the globe and a flag that dictates that Africa is in fact our homeland. So this flag, one can say, because don't get it twisted, you know, let's just set the record straight. Marcus Garvey was not the first one to talk about black nationalism, African nationalism, whatever you want to call it. You had people like Martin Delaney who came before him, who spoke about going to, uh, uh, going to West Africa. You know, once he rose up here academically and he saw that he couldn't break barriers. He talked about going back home, repatriating. So let's not get it twisted, but the flag, right? The flag that is behind me 
is the beginning of a new level of nationalism because in having our own flag, we have a banner that a visual banner, a symbolic banner, right? But most importantly, a, a, a banner that's dipped in sovereignty that allows people of African descent to unite around not our oppression necessarily, but our shared heritage as African people and our dominance of the earth, right? When we dominated the earth, there was equity, there was communalism, there were in indigenous societies. And while I don't see us going back there, I do envision a neo-indigenous pan-African uh, community. And we are moving toward that right now at a time when, you know, in the Trump White House and with the congressional representatives in both chambers, there's just not a lot of movement around providing safety nets for people who look like us, you know, and that has always been the case, you know, particularly during the Reagan era. And that has been the case all throughout our history here in the United States of America. So with the coronavirus, we are moving toward uh, the beginnings of a neo Afro indigenous society where African people are utilizing technology and they're communicating online and they're building nations and they're building communities where they can do for self and they can take part in the growing of gardens and whatever else you know we do to tend to our needs at a time when the government is just not doing it for us. But a lot of that started with the flag and that started with us recognizing ourselves not of the United States of America, but of the African diaspora. And it was also a rebuff to a popular white song, a white supremacist song, right? A, a, a song made by one who fashions himself as an oppressor, a song that was made to ostracize us, to put us down for not having the flag of our own. And it was called, I don't, you know, uh, every nation has a flag, every race has a flag, but the N word, you understand? So, you know, that, that song, you look it up, it was ridiculing African people who were oppressed here in the Western world for not having a flag of their own. And it's not just about the flag, it's about them recognizing uh, probably more so than us that we didn't have nationhood here. You know, that nationhood was, a sense of nationhood rather, was non-existent or not that it was non-existent, that they recognized that a sense, having a sense of nationhood could in fact unite African people, you know, not just in the United States, but beyond that. So they sung about that, they ridiculed us, right? All out of an effort to keep us, you know, entangled in a, 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 um, in a, in a US centric paradigm, right? A paradigm where we're beholden to the United States and we're not beholden to our heritage as African people. It's not necessarily about us being kings and queens and us coming from royalty. Don't get it twisted because we got it. That's another discussion, maybe for later on during our time here. But, you know, we can't, you don't have to use classist mind tricks and explanations to justify your need to want to go back. And colonialism and enslavement has made us want to do that. The very fact is that it's about culture by the very end of the day. And this flag represents that. This flag represents our, uh, uh, our attempt to retain our culture, to get a sense of who we are in the diaspora and to identify with one another and to unify politically under a paradigm that is not of the United States and of other, other colonizers and oppressors. That is the very fact that we are talking about today. And just like I said earlier, the conditions that brought forth this type of thinking are just as present today as they were in the 1920s. And I'm actually gonna read some more of the complaints that uh, uh, the UNIA laid forth here. So another complaint they laid forth. The European nations have parceled out among themselves and taken possession of nearly all of the continent of Africa. And the natives are compelled to surrender their lands to aliens and are treated in most instances like slaves. So what Marcus Garvey on uh, the UNIA rather is talking about during that time is the Berlin Conference that came out of the mid to, let's say the mid uh, 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 second half of the 19th century where they pretty much partitioned the African continent. So you had the UK got it, got some Germany, so forth and so on. And this is exactly what Marcus Garvey, what the UNIA rather was talking about, right? When they're talking about Europe, uh, Europe taking our land apart and making us slaves and us not really holding on to the resources. Very much the same thing is happening today.
in the form of gentrification here in the United States, tactics, right? Where people who do not look like us are, are parceling out the resources to other, no, where people who look like us, because that's how insidious the system is. People who look like us are parceling out the land to people who don't look like us. And we're getting, uh, and, and, and we're pretty much getting uh, 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 exploited, you know, on all corners of the world, you know, and as they exploit our brothers and sisters on the continent, they give us the resources in the form of phones and other things. And we feel like, you know, and people, you know, they, they, they often look at us in the United States and they ask about, well, how do we feel oppressed when we have this, this, that, and the third? But, you know, the very fact is that the very fact is that, you know, when well, you know, and uh, I want to welcome my brother, Doc Shepard. Uh, blessings, Doc. How you doing? I'm good, bro. How you feel? Doing our, doing our. Uh, before I let you, you know, uh, say a few things and just introduce yourself uh, a, a little bit, I wanted to wrap up I was making about the issues that were being talked about in the Declaration of the Rights of the Negro People in 1920 are very, very similar, if not the same, as the issues that we are discussing today. So low wages, uh, the partitioning of the uh, African continent, uh, segregation, right? What we have uh, de jour segregation today, just a whole lot of parallels between what was happening then and what's happening now. And what's happening then inspired the creation of the red, black, and green. Because at some point in time, the African nationalists or people who had that mindset, they recognized that nationhood was a key to, you know, our, to our self-determination. Self-determination is the key. You know, it always goes back to self-determination. And today, August 13th, is just another symbol of that. And we're talking about a flag. And we're talking about a banner that represents our yearning and our pathway to self-determination and pan-African sovereignty. So, you know, I'll stop there for now. Uh, uh, I'll give Brother Dr. Floor, you know, he always has a lot to say, a lot of great things. So, you know, please open up however you feel free. Uh, I believe that in terms of uh, in terms of moving forward with, you know, self-determination, um, one of the things that we could do that's, that's uh, in my mind, simple in, in that, in, in the route to full self-determination is creating our own holidays. So like how today would be such a day, you know, we got to actually make that into a holiday that we really, you know, observe and, you know, have events for, have things like this for. On different days, you know, they gave, they gave us Martin Luther King birthday, but not Malcolm X birthday, you know, just different things that we could do immediately that don't necessarily require us to do nothing different other than shift the mindset towards, you know, a date being important. Um, and I guess that lead me into that whole idea of just shifting the mindset of, you know, what 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 self-determination means, what does what that route look like, you know, in the modern day, things that we had access to today that they didn't have in the 20s and 30s. We're not using that to our best, you know, ability and our most creative, you know, creativity. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It starts with the families, you know. Uh, it starts with the self. That's true. It starts with the self. Each individual person. So even if your family not on it, you might be the black sheep of your family. You might be the black sheep of your friends group or whatever. It starts with the self for real. Start with yourself saying, "Okay, I'm black first, so African. Depending, you know, I, you know that that's a conversation, but I'm African first. You know, I told you, I was wondering when you was gonna pull out the good. My fault, excuse. Me. No, you good, you good. I but just uh, want to piggyback off of that point yeah. by saying, you know, oftentimes when we do make that transition and we have that consciousness, it opens up a whole new world for us. I know that that's how it was for me." living in D.C. my whole life and just seeing it in a new light, you know, after having uh, 
an awakening of sorts about Pan-Africanism. You know, I, I would agree. I think that Doc is right on by talking about self first, because self, you know, when you're talking about nationhood, you're talking about um, the different levels, which starts with God, family, and nation. But God is often synonymous with self, right? Because, you know, by serving God, you're serving yourself. And by putting, by delaying gratification and saving up and investing in self for a greater return tomorrow in the form of your own building, your own house, your own resources, right? That is serving yourself. And then once you do that in a family, you're serving a family and you're building a mini nation. And then you have several families on the same thing, on the same wave of consciousness and they're building a nation. So nation building happens at different levels, but it's also about, it starts with the raising of the consciousness and a shifting in one's thinking about who they are in relation to the world that they occupy. And I just want to welcome Baba Sangor uh, to the line. Hey, bro. Hey, bro. How you doing, man? Man, man. How you doing? I, I, I picked you up on my phone, brother. You was dropping such heavy reason and on the red, black, and green. And my brother, but I just go ahead on, man. I, I just nah. with you, man. thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, this is a very important day to all, you know, not just Garveyites, but all African people, whether they know it or not, because we got to set the record straight about what it is exactly we're doing this for. This is not a trend. It's not something that you do, you know, out of social media or because it's hot at the time. You know, this is a way of life and this is a paradigm shift, you know, and I think it's, you know, the conversation should actually pivot to the future because, you know, Pan-African nationalism, uh, 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 you know, given, given what's happening today, you know, it's going to look a whole lot different. And, you know, I'm actually... I want to holler at the scholars and I want to holler at the different people who are speaking about Pan-African nationalism as it is today, because, you know, given a whole lot of factors, you know, blackness is a very, very um, intangible concept for a lot of people. It's a very controversial concept, right? Who's considered black? Who's not considered black? You know, what does blackness mean, right? So when we're talking about nationalism, you know, to what degree are people ready to unify, right? And what are issues that are gonna keep us fragmented as a nation? Because, you know, uh, we're, living in a, in, we're living in a global society, man, you know, and even the most nationalistic of people, you know, have found a way to operate in a global society but maintain their culture. You know, what does that look like for African people? And, you know, those are questions that often, you know, come to my mind when I'm thinking about the state of the world today, because ever since the 1970s, it's like titans in industry. We've had billions of dollars flow through our communities, right, for our entertainers and for people who have developed quite a lot for us. And as a collective, we have not risen up. And I, and, and you know, and I know that drugs is a part of that. Drugs. Uh, uh, drugs and the breaking up of families, right? But I also think that a part of that was the class stratification and the redefinition of black and white on that whole spectrum, you know? Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I just want to reason with y'all. I want to build with y'all. I'm about to pull out some more text. I think that we need to be more of a reading people, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not just about YouTube and about this and that. We're going to pull out you know, some text and really reason on it. So I got Walter Rodney, uh, his book, Browns with My Brothers. All right, I got that for y'all, all right? And uh, the second chapter speaks about Black power and the basic understanding of what Black power is. So we can reason on this real quick. I, I want to hear what y'all think about this because this, something else right here. All right, since 1911, White power has been slowly reduced. The Russian Revolution put an end to Russian imperialism in the Far East, and the Chinese Revolution had emancipated the world's largest single ethnic group from the white power. 
complex. The rest of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, with minor exceptions, uh, as North Korea, North Vietnam, and Cuba, have remained within the white power network to this day. We live in the section of the world under white domination, the imperialist world. The Russians are white and have power, but they are not a colonial power oppressing black people. The white power, which is our enemy, is that which exercise over black peoples, irrespective of what group is in the majority and irrespective of whether the particular country belonged originally to black people, to whites or blacks. We need to look very carefully at the nature of the relationship between color and power in the imperialist world. There are two basic sections, one that is dominated and one that is dominant. Every country in the dominant metropolitan area has a large majority of whites. USA, Britain, France. Every country in the dominated colonial area has an overwhelming majority of non-whites. So such as Asia, Africa, and the West Indies. Power therefore resides in the white countries and is exercised over blacks. There is a mistaken belief that black people achieve power with independence, but a black man ruling a, a dependent state within an imperialist system has no power. He is simply an agent of the whites in the metropolis with an army and police force designed to maintain the, the imperialist way of things in that particular colonial area. Mm. Wow. <laughs> wow. Walter Rodney, Grounding with our brothers. Grounding yeah. with the brothers. Yeah, you know, I have a lot to say on that, you know, but, you know, today being the RBG day, you know, I, I've been so busy, man, uh, responding to people's posts. But let me let me say this uh, before I get into that, if I if I could on the red, black and green, because some people don't understand the metaphysical aspect of the red, black and green. Uh, the physical aspect is critical and we don't understand that properly. You know, people call it the liberation flag. They call it this, they call it that. But for real, for real. You can trace those tricolors back to the ancient Zing Empire hmm. before there were, uh, you know, states, countries, and all that. Those three colors, based on our brother Haru, are very significant where it relates to our ancestral and our universal power. Now, what the UNIA did in 1920 was take those tricolors and made them a flag, and you know. I don't see people decimating or trying to change anybody else's flag. So I stress to people, don't do that. Yeah. I mean, if you if you know you can create your own flag, but this flag is a flag that represents African people all over the world. And it's a universal flag because I believe that some of our elders that work with Garvey and Garvey himself understood spiritually the connection to the ancestors. Yeah. They may not have gotten to study and do all the things that we've gotten to do now all the way up to 1920, but we have done what Garvey says, science par excellence, and there have been those who have broke down those tricolors. And of course, red represents blood. Blood is life. Everybody knows without blood, you don't live. Red represents blood, but it also represents a connection, a connection to the order of the universe. Exactly. The ancient Dogon understood that. Red is very powerful. The sun. And it fire is powerful. And then also black, which represents our race, also represents the, 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 the universe itself. So when we start talking about red and black, it is very important to recognize how critical they are by the most high in our ancestors, even before the UNIA made it our official flag. And then when you get to the green, which represents not just the earth, but everything in the pureness thereof. And in order for us to get back on track, having a flag of that nature, which most of all the flags in Africa have either one or two, if not all of the tricolors within it, is powerful. And I'm not knocking on nobody else's flag, but this particular flag has metaphysical, physical, liberating, and sovereign uh, 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 focus. So if we concentrate, and we can't forget the goal. A lot of times, President General Keeley always reminds us that when the flag was first flown, it was flown with a gold trim. Mm. Those four colors are very critical because if you look at what's happening in terms of the resources of the planet, life, et cetera, et cetera, they all represent a connection to the universal realm and the ancestral realm. And now we come down to what is happening now, which is what you just read, Brother Walter Rodney laid down. 
because we have not recognized the importance of us having a flag, and we're not just talking about a flag for the United States. Some people think it's a liberation flag. That's not what it is. I mean, yes, we want liberation, but the reality is we want sovereignty for every African person on the planet. Walter Rodney was addressing the issues that need to be addressed, which keep us disempowered because everyone else plays off of our power. And we don't really understand how important our Blacktricity power really is and how powerful we are. So consequently, while we are being oppressed and downpressed and holding up everybody else's systems, our systems have gone to pot. So yeah. we are in the mode of rebuilding our systems and no longer holding up these other systems. I mean, I, I'm just sick and tired of looking at everybody attacking uh, uh, Camille, Camille Harris, for example, you know? I mean, let's be real. No American politics or politicians have ever strived to uplift African people or, or, or create sovereignty for African people. That's not, the, that's not what's in the constitution of the United States of America. So the reality is they're running for an office. And if we haven't learned in eight years of Barack Obama being president and being a black man of what can and cannot be done for us, then we got to really wake up. So for people uh, uh, attacking this sister, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't condone it. I know the history. I know the history of Biden and I know the history of, 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 of Camille Harris. That is not the issue here. The issue is of getting rid of what we are dealing with right now for three and a half years. And the reality is, even though I'm a race first person, I'm clear that us wasting time fighting over, you know, the, the background of a black woman is not the way to go. We need to be channeling that energy into raising us up. So anyway, back to Walter Rodney. Walter Rodney and what he just shared. I got some thoughts he, on that, Baba. I got some thoughts on that. No, go ahead, go ahead. What I wanted to say was, in reference to the whole Kamala Harris thing, I, I, I agree with you. And what I will also say is that people who, I'm of the mindset that a lot of people just want they want their their imperialism and their oppression to have a fancy face on it to have a face on it that That's is nice. that is poised that makes the united states look good it's 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 an adherence to a different type of nationalism it's not because they're so caught up in this right they want to they're beholden to the united states paradigm you know yes there's a that's what it's showing to me and you know that's part of our struggle, you know, helping people understand and showing them that the answer is not forcing this beast to change, but to change ourselves. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. To, and to become more self-determined. That's the goal. But let me say this, though. You're absolutely correct. But what Marcus Garvey was absolutely clear, that anywhere African people are, they have a human right to exercise their right to get the best possible, listen at me carefully now, because I, I don't want people to misunderstand, to get the best possible uh, people in office that's better than the worst. Now, I'm not telling everybody talk about two evils. That's not what I'm talking about. The reality is we need to be about building something for ourselves. But in the meantime, if you're in America, you need to understand the politics that exactly. take place. Because it's a politic thing. It's, it got nothing to do with having a politician that's going to be uh, a 100% acceptable to us. That's not going to ever happen. Barack Obama was not that. And you made it you made a great point. This country is going to do everything they can to hoodwink you, to make you think that they're moving in a direction, and that direction is really never going to manifest. The Democratic Party and the Reptilian Party is never going to do what we need to do for ourselves. However, let's be very clear. Black people were always at one point supporting of the reptilian party. Of course, yeah. And that switched around to the Democratic Party. But neither one of those parties are going to ever have our interest. But here's why the Democratic Party is so important. Black women and women, but especially black women, have literally held the Democratic Party together. Yeah. Now, people can say whatever they want. And our black women are not, are not asleep, not all of them to the realities that this country is not serving the best interests of those African people that are here. However, you can never expect a politician in this government to have the kind of energy that Garvey would have or Malcolm would have. 
So what I'm saying is, while we're here in America, you got to understand the politics and you got to roll with that. But in the meantime, you got to understand that that whole system has to come down of white terrorism. So if that system comes down, then you ain't got to play the electoral politic thing because you got to begin to do your own thing. So anyway, I hear you loud and clear and I totally agree with you. That is not letting nobody off the hook. That's not saying that the Democratic Party, if they win in November, is going to be a savior to us. We shouldn't expect that. But we also need to understand that the president and the vice president are not the only people running. And that exactly. we do have local issues that are critical. I'm just gonna say that exactly. And, and, and if you don't exercise that local right, then you need to just keep quiet and come on over to those of us that need your energy and let's build something that's better than America. And rather than try to, you know what I mean, fight down and fight your people. Last but not least, we never can forget the need for love and respect. It's okay to disagree, but we don't got time with our young brothers and sisters dying like they are around the world and women being abused to be disagreeable with each other, express your opinion and let's move on. I've checked out some of your posts and you're absolutely correct. We put too much energy into somebody else's uh, pot and we're not even, we're not even included really in that. We're not. Really, we're not. We're not. So, so at the meantime, what we need to be doing, if we're upset about some somebody, we need to turn that energy more into building something of significance for ourselves. Because for real, for real, we built this country, we built Europe. Um, we really did, we built it. African people built it. And, and the reality is we continue to try to hold it up and, and beg for something. And so that's why it's important to be a universal Pan-African nationalist. That's why it's important to relate to the flag. That's why it's important to listen to people like ancestor Walter Rodney, who told us a long time ago, specifically what the issue was in terms of politics. Uh, we got people that say, they don't want to deal with Africa. Well, come on. Everybody in the world, no, no matter what they are, counts on the resources of Africa. That's a fact. Exactly. Nothing would be happening anywhere in the world without the resources of the continent. So why are we as African people that are the chosen people and the first humans on the bottom of everything when Africa truly has all the resources that can feed everybody and serve the whole world? So we have to begin to go back to what Kwame Nkrumah and even Sel Haile Selassie and all of them were clear that we need a United States of Africa sooner than later. We cannot wait for two, uh, 2064 when all of us, most of us will be ancestors and the next generation won't even be clear on what needs to happen. So anyway, uh, let's get back to Walter Rodney because I, I don't, I don't wanna get too off, but I'm, I'm pumped because for me, the ancestors are moving through us. And if you study people like Walter Rodney and you study people and what they've done, you can't just call their names. I mean, that's great, but you gotta study their works so you can understand why we aren't where we need to be and how we can be a vision to get where we need to be. And so I'm gonna I'm let somebody else chime in, but Walter Rodney was, was, was a, that's why they killed him because he was definitely on point and that's why they killed Patrice Lumumba. That's why, they, that's why they've killed uh, uh, Thomas Sankara. These brothers and sisters, despite the, the, the little differences that they may have had in the ideological approaches, had one major goal, and that was a united African people all over the world, coming back into their power, following what we did in ancient commit. Brother Heru broke it down to us about that red, black, and green the other night, man. And we're gonna carry it on tonight again on David Horn's show, because we're trying to get brothers to understand that you are you are spiritually linked to that, whether you whether you realize it or not, it's 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 that powerful that it connects you metaphysically to the red, black, and green. Just like when you eat watermelon, which happens to be one of the most healing fruits on the planet, it's red, black, and green. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. Yeah. Red, black, and green fruit red, black, and green flag. Oh, all that is important. They used to laugh at us and, and, and create Sambo pictures of us eating watermelon. Well, guess what? We were already connected to all that energy. So today with the RBG, the RBG is on point. However, now what we gotta do is to bring it down on a more physical, practical level is what we're doing to build for the United States of Africa. We're trying to bring together, cause everybody around the world understands the red, black, and green now. Yeah. When I say they understand it, they might not understand what it, where it came from and what it totally represents, but they understand it's a flag for African people. 
You exactly. understand? You know, exactly. and so so now that we got that point, now we got to get to the next point because the Declaration of Rights of Negro African peoples of the world was established and the Declar Article 39 was the one that established the flag. But there were plenty of articles and people need to re re revisit that document because it addresses issues that we running around here begging other people for where we place the demands out there and with power behind those demands, we can make them a reality. That is the entire Declaration of Rights of African peoples of the world, uh, which goes with the flag. I mean, you know, we got the August the 31st coming up and I heard my brother earlier, he was so right. We need our own holy days. Exactly. I say holy days rather than holidays because they need to be days that we reflect upon our ancestral energy and our power. And yes, today should be a, 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 a holy day and we should revere it and we should never forget it. This 100 years is one, but we in the UNIACL RC 2020 are looking at the next 100 years because certainly we cannot let Africa continue to be exploited, let neo-colonialism, let white terrorism continue to rule around the world. And we can see it falling, but it ain't gonna fall until we get up out of here or move away from it and create our own. And exactly. believe me, sooner than you think, Garvey said in 24 hours, we could change stuff if we all get on the same page. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm stop, man, because I'm fired up as you can see. Uh, the, the, the spirit of Garvey and the spirit of uh, uh, Thomas Sankara and all of them are just rolling, man. And they're saying, hey, when are y'all going to get it? You know, it's time. The time is now. Africa is the most rapid growing economy in the world. Why are we on the bottom? Because we have not understood the power that the Most High and our ancestors have left us to rise. And believe me, that's very important. You know, because they laughed at us. It was like, you know, coons, you don't got a flag. Well, now we got a flag. Exactly. We got a flag for exactly. 100 years. And we're going to go to the next 100 years. And our flag ain't for one continent. Our flag is for wherever, whatever geographical location African people are in. That's our flag. Exactly. I say to that. I say to that. Uh, at this point, you know, the party's going to continue later on this evening. I'm joining Baba Sam, going some other folks uh, online. But... We are going to wrap the reasoning up. Uh, journalism calls for me, you know, having to go out and about with the people where the action is and where people have needs and just documenting that. So this is where a lot of my work came out of just being a journalist and later on growing in consciousness as I saw what was happening around D.C. and around the world. Uh, to a point, you know, in closing, what I want to say, and I'll give Baba Sangor and hopefully Brother Doc, if he has a second or two, you know, just, just some closing statements, right? Uh, 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 Walter Rodney, a point that he brought up that, that I want people to pay attention to in light of what we're talking about with Kamala Harris, right, is this talk about a Black politician who is working in, a, in an imperialist society. So for people who live in Black nations that were formerly beholden to European powers, you know, so the Caribbean and the African continent, they have the same issue. They have presidents and prime ministers and whoever else who are beholden to the European powers and who do yes. stuff in the interest of the European powers, of the colonial powers, and not of the people. It's the very same case here with Kamala Harris and whoever else, you know, is chosen for the ticket. Now, yes. me, I didn't say much, you know what I'm saying, you know, because no matter who Joe Biden chose, or no matter who was on the Democratic ticket, I would have had something to say. But people of course. know my politics, and they know that, you know, I wouldn't even speak on that as if I don't have a choice in who I'm going to vote for, right? You know, because I vote. Don't get it twisted. I, 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 I understand the power of the vote, but I also understand that the vote at the national level is not really potent with the electoral college and all, but I know that locally it can That's be right. very powerful if black people are organized and if That's they right. all move their vote toward one way, toward a person or entity that will work in black people's favor. The Democratic Party has no interest in exclusively helping black people and allowing black people to be self-determined. So I, as a Pan-African nationalist, I have no interest in voting for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, Bernie Sanders, he's an independent, but whatever, or whoever they give on that Democratic ticket. 
So to me, it's not an issue of whether or not Trump wins or if we return to normalcy. It's about where black people will be in terms of planning for self-determination after November 4th. Overstood, overstood, overstood. Uh, well, you know, you, 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 you hit some key points, brother, and everybody has that, that right. You know, for many years, I was an independent. Uh, and I have voted Democratic, but I'm, I'm clear on what you just said, which is critical. But, but I'd like to end on this note, man, because this flag is very important to me. It's a life situation. I commit my body, mind, and spirit to the protection, defense, and security of the red, black, and green. I dedicate my life to the redemption of Mother Africa and to the liberation of her scattered black children. Hmm. I accept for myself and my descendants the teachings of universal African nationalism and promise that our children will be instilled with the purpose and knowledge of themselves as African people in order that the cause of our struggle will neither falter nor fail until all black people are free and united through one God, one aim, one destiny. That's what the red, black and green means. That's the pledge to the flag that goes with the UNIA and the flag. And so if you listen to what was said in that pledge, that's giving your life to the red, black, and green. But it's giving your life to save and uplift yourself and your race. It's also giving your life to redeem Africa. So when you fly the red, black, and the green, that's what you should stand for. And if you don't understand, get with somebody who can give you some overstanding. Praise the red, the black, and the green. Brothers and sisters must be redeemed. Open up our eyes and see. It ain't about individuality. It's about collectivity. And there's more Africans on the planet than most people have any idea of. I say, I say. Uh, Brother Doc, if you're still there, if you got a couple closing words for us. Yeah, it's hard to follow that up. <laughs> No, that's no, Doc. Doc, Doc, you, Doc, you, you started it all, Doc. <laughs> nah, um, I just, I just feel as though the, the, the things that we can do, we should do, and the things that we can't do, we need to plan on, um, and just you know take the incremental steps, uh, individually and then collectively, of course, um, until we get to that point. Um, I, I don't think that it's it's not really a linear, you know, linear path of just saying this, this, like, there are a lot of things that have to happen over a long period of time, you know, even internally without anybody else's, you know, input. If they would, if say the system was just to start be fair, you know, 100%, we wake up tomorrow morning and the system's like, all right, fair system now. <laughs> most, black, most black people wouldn't even know how to take advantage of that, let alone, you know. Um, tell the truth let alone have, you know, any real understanding of really even what that even means, like, to even know what that, what that day-to-day -day life is, like, th there's a lot of internal things that we got to do that we can do, that's, that's, you know, mindset, education, information that is free and available to us now, where at one point in time it was, it was well hidden, you know, amongst, amongst places that we really didn't have access to that, that well with this technology and the computer and whatnot, we can kind of learn about pretty much everything that, that's known at this point. And then we got a lot of walk-in libraries like, like Bobby Hill, like that just know stuff, you know what I'm saying? Cause they were there, you know what I mean? Like stuff that, stuff that doesn't get reported, stuff that's not on the newspaper, stuff that's not, you know, in books and that type of thing. You had to be there. You had to know these individuals and, you know, and when you did, and we and having somebody like him on the line that could tell us, you know, X Y Z happened. I know because I was there. It's like we need to be taken from that, um, taken from that experience, and you know, building on it with what's going on today, like how we were talking about Kamala Harris and that type of thing. She's only one person, you know. Exactly. She's not gonna be. She's not gonna be our, you know, saving grace or whatever the case may be. You know what I mean? We, we saw Obama go in and what happened. This is not gonna be nothing, you know, more or less different. Like, but until, until, until it's a point where we're saying, okay, we're voting on the United Africa president or whatever you wanna call it, you know, until mm -hmm. that's the conversation, then, you know, whatever America decides to do, 
I mean, we should know about it in order to be able to adapt and, you know, live while we're still here. But I think the, the bulk of our focus needs to really be, you know, how, how do we get out united, whatever we feel like calling it. Because I don't, I honestly, just to say, I honestly don't believe that every Black person on the planet is all going to go under one sect of anything. Of course not. However, um, however, the same way how the United States and other countries have the United That's right. Nations. That's right. They had the United Nations. They had the Trilateral Commission. They had, That's right. you know, these, these different individual co- collaborations. We could collaborate with, with the ones that we more or less agree with the most. And then the ones that we don't, it's like, okay, exactly. we're, just, we're, we're not at war with you, but you're just not in the Trilateral, you know. So it's just, we just got, we got to do what we can do while we can do it, because there's a lot of opportunities that we have now that, in my opinion, won't be, if we don't take advantage of them now, they won't even be there, you know, three, five years from now. Um, You know, with net neutrality and that type of thing, with them getting a hold on blockchain and, and dark web and that type of thing. Um, there's a lot of opportunities that we have right now to really mobilize and do things. We just really got to do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We really got to really got to start small and don't think of anything as too small to matter. You know, exactly. those, those, those small Legos, that one Lego that you step on in the middle of the night be, be the worst, right? It don't even got to be a whole thing, but we just got to set it one puzzle piece at a time and, you know, do what we need to do. I say. I say. Uh, w- once again, thank y'all uh, for coming on. Uh, this is not our last reasoning. We got some more coming up very soon. You'll hear an announcement, and we and, and we all gonna bring some some other guests on. This whole Zoom thing, I'm getting used to it. I like it. I miss San Kofa. I ain't I ain't gonna hold you, but but yeah, I like right. it here. I like it here too. So we'll make it work, and uh, you guys will know at a later date um, when we're doing our other reasonings. But you know, all hail the red, black, and green. One yeah. God, one aim, one destiny. And I love y'all, man. Appreciate Let's you. Touch, appreciate, appreciate you, brother, you, for all you have done. You've done quite a bit. Uh, and it is important to to, to, to keep stuff going. Uh, all eyes on DC. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate all you. Right,